I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. You know, the more we develop land to meet our needs, the more we're encroaching on all this native habitat, which is displacing a lot of plants and animals. And, you know, many of those are already threatened and some are disappearing forever because of it. One way to help with the situation is to create habitats for local wildlife in our backyards, public areas, and even at school. The wildlife find a new home and the people find a whole new appreciation for the environment. One elementary school has taken this idea to a whole new level. The Ford School in Ackworth, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, launched over 17 years ago with only $200 and a single gardening bed. The gardens today cover almost 20 acres and include several wildlife habitats, nature trails, pollinator gardens, and edible landscapes. Their extensive science and environmental program teaches nearly 700 students and involves their parents in the process so that many generations learn environmental life lessons. Currently, every class, from music to math, spends at least some time outdoors, and they extend those lessons to include a service and outreach component that includes the community around them. Catherine Padgett is a math and reading specialist at Ford School, who was also one of the founding teachers of the gardening program. Currently, she volunteers as the liaison between the school and the community, and is the project manager of some of their sustainability and outreach programs. Our main goal in 1994 in developing our outdoor learning labs was to be able to enrich and enhance what was being taught in the classroom, moving our children into an authentic environment where they could have that hands-on application. That was our primary goal. Secondary was to begin to restore some of our habitats that had been destroyed in construction of the school. Environmental education has always been key here at Ford. We were a certified schoolyard habitat the year that the school was built, and so we remain committed to preserving our natural resources and our habitats on our campus, as well as educating our children uh, of the value of preserving that. We began uh, with that developing our first garden in 1994, and that was the original children's garden. From there, we moved to developing uh, butterfly habitats, native gardens, Georgia native habitats, we have a uh, native tree arboretum. We have two or three aquatic areas and many amphitheaters in our wooded areas. So we have a small classroom in the woods and then we also have a pretty extensive nature trail with a student observation deck. It's a preserved area for us and it's a place where we teach many of our science lab lessons as well as many of our earth parent lessons. Our latest inspiration and installation has been a geometric uh, structured math garden. And this is a garden where we see a chance to have a lot of integration opportunity. We um, are developing curriculum for that right now and our students are already out there actively uh, taking those lessons, those math content lessons that they're learning in the classroom and getting a chance to actually apply them. Our primary goal with the math garden is to bring the content that's being learned in the classroom at every grade level into an authentic, everyday, real life experience where these children are measuring, they're growing, they're charting, they're doing data analysis, and really learning how an outdoor classroom lab can actually enhance what they're learning in the inside. So we're very excited and see this as being a, um, a brand new integration area for us. 
So here at the school, the teachers and the volunteers spend so much time making sure they fully integrate all the various age groups with the curriculum around all these gardens scattered around the school. Now the first graders, they're learning about the different parts of the plant, so they'll plant these beds out starting with seeds. The second graders are learning about the various stages of wildlife, like the birds and the butterflies. And because so many of these plants are natives, it does a great job of attracting the honeybees. And the honeybees are really important at boosting the production of the vegetables, which are very important for the math and the nutrition class. So you see how all this works together. But the beauty of it is all the students get to spend time in this amazing environment in these outdoor classrooms, and it doesn't take very long to realize just how much all the students love learning outside. How's it going, everybody? Good. Good. What are you planting? Cabbage. Perfect. Nice soil. Very good. One of the other areas that we are working hard to integrate into our curriculum are our social studies gardens. Right now, we have a Three Sisters, which is a Native American legend garden, and that involves the planting and the relationship between your corn, your bees, and your squash. One of the ways we've been able to create authentic learning experiences for our kids in the outdoor learning labs is by working with the National Wildlife Federation and, and their emphasis on habitat restoration and on certified schoolyard habitats. We have done this through uh, most of our gardens and developing pollinator gardens. The gardens at Ford are used every day. They are built along natural pathways that our children travel to and fro. We intentionally put educational signage where as they enter the building and they exit the building and they are around the perimeter of the building, they are uh, learning seamlessly. Ford has been committed from the very beginning to the sustainability of both the education component and the physical and the financial responsibility that it takes to maintain a program over time. Um, to say that it's a, a, a local project, uh, it's more than that. It's our community, it's our statewide network, it's our scout programs, it's our students, of course, it's our parent volunteers who are trained every year by us as Earth volunteers and they, they allow us, along with the science lab, to extend and enrich our students' lives. Financially, we always say never build bigger than you can support educationally. So sustainability without that element, it would be impossible um, work days are required, of course, and we depend on um, our volunteer force and committed teachers and committed people in our community. It's a well-oiled machine at this point in that it has been so embedded and our community feels passionate about it, as, as we do. And I have no doubt that 20 years from now, it will still be going strong and still enriching the lives of our students and our community. I love learning in the garden because it's just it engages you in what you're learning and when you when you like see that you're outside it kind of makes you think well this is fun because I get to learn and I also get to be outside. I learn so much. I learn about the plants and the animals and the adaptations and it's so much fun digging in the dirt but you're still in the outdoor classrooms and you just learn and you get to be outside at the same time and it's just awesome because you, you learn math, you learn the angles, the edges, the shapes, but at the same time you're out in the garden, which is so much fun. My favorite part of being out in the garden is looking at all the butterflies that we did in the Victory Garden, like our plants were so small and now they're so big, so that it it means a lot to walk out here and see that everybody can see our butterflies that we worked really hard on and to see how big our plants are growing. What I love about learning in the outdoors is you get to see the birds and the trees and you get to hear everything and see everything and you're still learning which is awesome because the te uh, like teachers they need time to to teach us and we want time to be outside and this is kind of like a compromise but it's awesome because we get to do both. I think learning outside is great because um, you get to tie in other subjects and it just makes you think about the world in a different way.
It's easy to see how much people, and especially children, can get out of interacting with nature in the outdoors. But it's also important to remember how much we can give back to wildlife simply by creating places that allows it to thrive. Many of the gardens at Ford Elementary are certified wildlife habitats, but we can create those at home too. And it doesn't matter whether you have a large garden or just a small space, you too can draw in nature and create a mutually beneficial environment. Helping people do just that is a key role for David Mizajewski. He's a naturalist and media personality with the National Wildlife Federation, one of the largest conservation groups in America. He also manages their wildlife habitat program, which inspires people to create wildlife sanctuaries in their home gardens. By connecting people, and especially children, to the outdoors, David hopes to develop their appreciation for nature that, in turn, helps safeguard more habitats in the future. Wildlife are losing habitat all around the world, and a wildlife garden might not seem like it's gonna do that much, but believe me, it does. When you turn your yard, or any garden space really, into something you know that has some native plants in it and restores a little bit of that, of that habitat, the wildlife will show up, they'll definitely benefit from it, and what's really cool about it is that you get the benefits too. You get to go outside and experience nature literally right outside your door, you know, hear the bird song, smell the flowers, and ultimately know that you're doing something really good for the planet. One of the biggest misperceptions about wildlife gardening is that that means you have to attract every single animal right up to your back door. And that's not the case. If you want to focus your efforts on attracting birds or butterflies or even maybe frogs, you can do that. And you don't necessarily have to invite in the raccoons and you know, the deer and the other animals that might eat up all your plants. And National Wildlife Federation recognizes that and our program is about teaching people how to attract what you want and also how to avoid conflict with the other wildlife. The National Wildlife Federation started the Certified Wildlife Habitat Program all the way back in 1973. And the whole idea behind it was sort of twofold. It was one, to help the wildlife. I think that's sort of the obvious thing. You know, gardening, attracting them in, restoring their habitat. Um, but the second thing was also all about people, giving people a place, again, where they can go outside, connect with nature. And those two things remain the same today, you know, all these years later. And it really boils down to four simple things. If you provide food, water, cover, and places for the wildlife to raise their young, in your garden, the wildlife will show up. And it's as simple as that. And when you do that, you can submit an application, and if you meet our basic requirements, National Wildlife Federation will certify your yard in our program. So David, here we are in a typical neighborhood. This one happens to be just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. But the garden, not so typical, because this is a certified wildlife habitat. And I know that plants play a major role as a food source, but I'd love for you to talk in more detail about that as well as the other steps to certify a garden. That's right, yeah. When you think about feeding the wildlife, the first thing you want to think about is your plants. That's why this is a gardening program, because <laughs> Mother Nature feeds the wildlife primarily through plants. That's the bottom of the food chain. And so plants are providing nectar, like these milkweeds. This is swamp milkweed. It's going to get a beautiful pink flower. We've got some white milkweed over here, some butterfly milkweed, yeah. which is orange. These are going to attract butterflies and bees and all sorts of other pollinators. You know, they're just amazing plants. Other plants are going to provide seeds and nuts and berries, and those are going to feed the birds and other animals as well. So your native plants really are the, the main things that you want to think about when it comes to feeding the wildlife. And what about all these insects right here? Did you notice all the aphids here? <laughs> Absolutely, and that's actually, there's sort of a second benefit of native plants, and that's that they support so many more insects than exotic plants do that you see so often in landscapes. Now, insects are important wildlife in and of themselves, but they're also a critical food source for critters higher up on the food chain. 96% of songbirds rely on insects as a primary food source, and so if you don't have the bugs, you don't have the birds. Okay, so what about all those bird feeders that we scatter all around our backyards? How important are they really then? You know, they're not really critical in terms of feeding the, the wildlife, especially if you have good native plants out there, because the birds really only use them to supplement the natural foods that they find, so they're really kind of more for us, because you can attract the birds in close to where you can see them. Okay, so when I go on vacation this summer, I don't have to freak out if the bird feeder gets empty then? That's right, again, as long as you have good native plants out there, the birds are going to be fine year-round. Awesome. Well, I'm about to add two right now. If you don't mind holding yeah. those, I'll start digging. Okay. Great. This is the perfect spot. David, water is another important component to certifying your habitat. Speak to that. Well, wildlife need water for drinking. I think that's pretty obvious. But birds also need it for bathing to keep their feathers in good condition. Now, you can have a great big garden pond. That's a great way to provide water. Or it could just be a simple bird bath. Now, what about putting water sources at different heights? Is that important? Yeah, I mean, if you have a bird bath like this, birds are gonna be able to come to it. But if you put the same thing flat on the ground, animals that can't climb or fly, like rabbits or turtles, can come get a drink too. 
Now, providing shelter and cover is another very important requirement and an easy one to check off the list if you have some dense vegetation like this hedge right here. Exactly right. You know, the same plants that are going to provide food are going to do double duty and provide shelter as well. And of course, the wildlife needs shelter from the elements, you know, bad rainstorms and bad temperatures and all that kind of thing. They also need shelter from predators, or if they're predators, they need shelter to kind of hide and lie in wait for their prey. Right, okay. Now what about adding something else in addition to the vegetation, what can we do? Yeah, you, you know, you want to focus on your vegetation, but you can add things like brush piles and rock piles and rock walls. These places become little wildlife hotels. And, um, you know, you can also put up a roosting box, which is kind of like a nesting box for birds, but the hole is at the bottom and inside it it's our little perches. And the birds go in there and huddle together and keep warm in the winter. And speaking of nesting boxes, this is one of the best ways to provide places to raise young in your landscape for the wildlife. Right. So this is a chickadee titmouse nesting box. Okay. And why don't you go ahead and put a nail right in there. We'll get this up on the tree. Perfect, and you can put another one down there. Got it. There you go. Okay. So what this is going to do is replicate the natural cavities that are going to be found in trees that are out in the landscape, usually dead trees. And you know, you might not have a dead tree in your front yard or you might not want one there. <laughs> so if you put up a nesting box, it kind of mimics that and the birds will come in and raise the next generation. Now beyond the steps to create the garden, it's just as important to maintain it in an eco-friendly way, right? That's right, yeah. You can create all this habitat and attract wildlife, but if you're spraying toxic chemicals everywhere, it kind of defeats the purpose. Right. The other thing that you can do to be sustainable is minimize the size of your lawn. Lawns really don't have any habitat value, and it doesn't mean that you have to get rid of all of your lawn, but what you want to do is create beautiful beds like this where you can put in lots of habitat vegetation. You could still have the lawn, and it's really a win-win. Yeah, it's the best of both worlds, That's right? That's right. And you can certify your habitat online as well. That's right, and we hope lots of people do. And they can by going to our website. You'll find it under the show notes for this episode. The address is the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. We really can help the wildlife population if we just take the steps to give them what they need at home and on the grounds in the schools of our communities. It's also easy to see how getting in touch with nature can not only help us, but it can also benefit the wildlife we're trying to protect. We have a lot more information on our website about certified wildlife habitats and schoolyard gardens. It's under the show notes for this episode on our website, and that address is the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. I'm Joe Lample. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.